Hey, hi, my name's Sam Hendrick. I'm from Bentley Systems. And if you've watched the other five videos in this series, thank you and congratulations. In this video, what we're gonna talk about is basically four things. First, we're gonna talk about attaching a raster file and what if you don't have raster data, what do you do? Bing Maps, gonna show you how you can bring that in. Second, we'll talk about point clouds, how to attach a point cloud, and then what do you do with it once you've got it attached? Third, not so much an attach as an import. We're gonna talk about how to import a land XML file. And then fourth and final, we're gonna talk about how to attach as a reference file, a 3MX or reality mesh. If you watched the fifth video in the series, towards the end, I talked about how I created a reality mesh from photos taken by a drone and then created a 3D model. We're gonna talk about how to attach that as a reference file this time. So let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump right in. Okay, continuing the theme of attaching external data, the next thing we're gonna look at is attaching raster data. Raster data can take on a lot of different formats. JPEGs, TIFF, PDFs, GeoPDFs. The one we're gonna be attaching is an ECW file. I'm gonna be opening up another file. Again, this one ships with example workset. It's called GIS data. And when the file opens up, you can see here I've got a civil engineering drawing. I've got roadways and buildings. Now I'm going to be attaching an ECW file. I'm going to go back up to my primary group and under attach tools, we've already looked at references. Now we're going to take a look at raster manager. Now the raster manager dialog opens and you can see right now in the list box, like we did with our reference files, we have no rasters attached. So there's a couple of different ways you can go about attaching. There's the file menu here. I can go to attach and I can select raster or there's an icon right here and I can hit the down button and I can see the same options. So I'm gonna choose this method. I'm gonna go to raster. Now it'll again go to the last place that you attach. I've already attached this. So this one's called metrostation.ecw. It's a form of raster. Now there's some options down here during the attachment process. There's open as read only, there's place interactively, and then open settings dialog. Now we're gonna be leaving these set. Our file, the metrostation ecw, already has coordinate data. So we wouldn't wanna place it interactively. If we chose that, we would then have to pick two points, basically drawing in a rectangle, and we would have to decide where it goes. Now the different formats that we can attach. If I click here, you can see there's pretty much every format you could imagine in the world in a raster, we can attach it. So it's just pretty much endless. It's very flexible. So the one we've chosen is going to be common geo referenced. This is our file. I'm going to leave these settings set. I'm going to click open. And then the raster attachment options appear. Now there's some pretty standard options like there's place interactively. We already told it we didn't want to do that. Under the general tab, you're going to see level. What this will do is it will associate the attachment of the raster to that level. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? That means if I turn that level off, the raster will turn off. Now, there are other ways to turn off a raster. So I would suggest you choose a level that does not have elements that you want to turn off in the future and leave your raster turned on. So in this case, we're just going to leave it set to default. We're just going to go with the rest of the options here. We're going to click attach. You can then see my raster image appears in the background. You see it also listed here on the list box. Now, when I select this, the other way to turn off rasters, and this is the recommended method, is by view. I can click view one, that turns the raster off. I can click it again. So this is attaching a raster. Now, once I have it attached, I can, depending upon the raster format, I can clip the raster, I can warp the raster. These days, most rasters come in coordinate correct and you don't need to mess with them much at all. So in this case, we're good. Now I'm gonna detach this raster. So I'm gonna select this raster. I'm gonna right click on it and you're gonna see options. One of them is detach. I'm gonna choose detach and I've detached it. Now, the next example I'm gonna show you, this is gonna be a different file. I'm gonna show you how, if you don't have raster files, like for example, the ECW or TIFF or JPEG, how do you get information? Well, I'm gonna show you how we can use Bing Maps. Now, I'm going to do a file open. I'm gonna come up here, file open. I'm gonna be changing files. So I'm gonna be going to the DGN. This is a file that does not ship with the exercise files. I'm gonna be opening up, it's one we've been in before and we saw how to attach reference files. In this file, 
we would like to bring in raster information, but we have no aerial information. We did not fly the area. So now we're going to use Bing Maps. On the Raster Manager dialog, again, the shortcut here, if I click it for attach, you're going to see Bing Maps down below. Now, this does require you to get a free license from Microsoft. You will have to register to be able to do this. So this is something your CAD manager will take care of for you. Under Bing Maps, I select that, and then I get the Raster Attachment Methods, just as we had before. So for Level here, you can see this is associated to this level. Again, you want to associate it to a level that you can turn off independently, something you created or something called raster. Now below this, this is what's unique to Bing Maps. Under layers, if I click here, there's three choices. I can show just roads, just like a map, like you would see on your browser, or aerial, just aerial, no road signs, or aerial with labels. So I'm going to choose road first, and we're going to change it after it's attached. So I'm going to click attach, and you'll see the roadway raster attached in the background. Now I'm going to zoom in here and you can see there's my Bing Maps attached in the background and you can see there's my roadway labels. I see street labels, things like that. Now if I wanted to see the labels plus I wanted to see the aerial, I can come back to my raster manager. I can right click on it and on the Bing Maps option, you can see where I can change this from road to aerial or aerial with labels. I'm going to change it to aerial with labels. And you'll see the aerial with the labels comes in. Now I have raster in the background and this raster information that you see in the background, whether it was the roads or the roads with labels, if I was to create or print a PDF, uh, that would also go with it. So that's attaching rasters if you have raster data or if you don't using Bing Maps. Oh, sorry, just cutting in here for a second. Sorry to interrupt your viewing here, but I just showed you how to turn on Bing Maps by going to the Raster Manager dialog and doing it. Well, one of my coworkers, John Melbert, did a video about how you can do the same thing, but go to View Attributes dialog and just turn on Bing Maps. I think that's pretty cool. Check out this link or down below and you'll see how you can do it too. Back to our regular scheduled programming. This time, what we're going to be attaching is what's called a point cloud. Now, a point cloud is created by using a laser, and the laser, wherever the laser strikes an object or a surface, it records that position in a three-dimensional space, and we can create a file from that. Now, we've got a file that's already created for us. So it's called point cloud. Now, the file currently is empty. We're going to be attaching a point cloud. This one is provided with the example workspace. I'm going to come up here. I'm in the drawing workflow. I'm going to go to my primary tab. I'm going to go to attach, just like we did for the references and rasters. And you're going to notice there's point clouds. I'm going to select point clouds. And this is where I'm going to be attaching a point cloud. So I'm going to go ahead and click attach point cloud. Now it remembers the last place I was at. So this is the last point cloud that I attached. Down in the bottom right corner, you're gonna see the different types of formats for point clouds that we can attach. And you're going to notice there's quite a few options here. So the one we're gonna be using is called a POD. So that's the one we've selected. I'm gonna click open and you can see the point cloud is attached. Now, if I zoom in on this, what you're going to see are just a series of small points or dots. Now this is currently displaying it with no kind of coloration or anything. There are other ways to display a point cloud. In this case, they are just showing up as a black dot. We're gonna be opening up our view attributes dialog and we're gonna be changing how the point cloud is displayed. So I'm gonna to go to my view attributes. Whenever you have a point cloud attached, at the very bottom, you're going to see point cloud styles. Right now, the style is set to none. I'm going to go ahead and change that to elevation. Now, the point cloud, these points were not captured with color, so they're just gray. If they were captured with color, if this was an outdoor scene, not an indoor scene, then we could use the RGB value. But in this case, we're just going to use elevation. Now, you can see the points in the point cloud are classified by their vertical position. I'm going to close view attributes. And if I rotate the view around, you can see all of the points there that make up this point cloud. Now this point cloud is coordinate correct. So I already have another reference file attached. So I'm going to turn this reference file on to help illustrate why would I want a point cloud and how can it help me in my design process. I'm going to open my reference file dialog box. I'm going to go back up to my primary group and I'm going to select references. 
And you can see I already have a reference file attached. It's called ventilation. I'm now just going to turn this on. So I'm going to go ahead and click display. And you can now see the reference file displayed coordinate correct with the point cloud. Now I'm going to go ahead and rotate my view around. And you can see how this would be helpful to place other equipment or structures in relationship to, in this case, the interior of a cave wall. This time, what we're going to do is not so much attach something as we are going to import something. And what we're going to be doing is importing what's called a land XML file. Now, a land XML file is used by a lot of different software to be able to exchange between the software. It contains a lot of civil features. In this case, we've got a file here. It's a 3D file. It's called Morro Rock. And if you're familiar with the California coast, there is a place called Morro Rock. And this land XML file is going to be this area. So I'm going to go ahead and open the file. Now, to be able to do this, you need to obviously be in a 3D file. I'm going to be going to my drawing workflow up here, and then I'm going to go to annotate tab. And then over here under terrain modeling, we've got a number of options. We're going to look at import land XML terrain model. So I'm going to click this. Now it comes up and it says, where is the land XML file? In this case, I've already attached it once. So it goes to the last place you were at. I'm going to come down. I'm going to click open. On the Land XML Import dialog, you're going to see the option for Terrain. Now, MicroStation by itself supports the importing of just surfaces. Land XML as a format supports the transfer of other information like brake lines, alignment, things like that. In this case, all we want is surfaces, so we're going to click Import. You're then going to see the Land XML file up here. Now, if I hover my cursor over this, you're going to see it comes up as a terrain element type. Now, this was introduced late in V8i. This is being displayed as triangles. Now, this is an element. I'm going to move my cursor over the element. I'm going to, on my mouse, press and hold the right button. The context menu appears. Properties is at the bottom. Now, the properties dialog comes up. Up at the top, you can see there's calculated features and source features. I'm going to go to calculated features, and you can see the features that came across. Right now, triangles are set to on, and contours, major and minor, both set to off. I'm going to reverse this. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to click for major contours, change it from off to on. I'm going to do the same thing for my minors. And then I'm going to tell it that I want to turn off the triangles. So I'm going to turn off triangles. Now you can see. My contours are displayed. You can see the Morro Bay rock there. It's got quite a bit of elevation relative to the shoreline nearby. Now this is an element called terrain. Now you can't edit this element other than its appearance. As long as this is a terrain element, it's kind of limited as to what you can edit. You can change its appearance from triangles to contours, and that's about it. But what you can do is you can drop this. Now if you're familiar with the drop element tool, I'm going to go to my space bar. On my space bar in the upper right corner, first row is groups. I'm going to click there. And on the pop-up, you're going to see drop. Now, this is a common tool in MicroStation. I'm going to select this tool. Now, in order for me to drop this element, I'm going to need to check application elements. If I don't check that, I won't drop it. So I'm going to move my cursor over the edge, and I'm going to data, dropping it just like any other element in MicroStation. It's no longer a terrain element. It is now just, in this case, line strings. You can see as I move my cursor along. Now, I'm going to close my properties dialog. So there is my contour from the land XML file. So we'll go ahead and look at a top view. And here's my contours for this. So that's importing a land XML file. Hopefully you found that informative. Okay, this is going to be the final attachment process. In this situation, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be attaching a 3MX file or reality mesh. Now I've already got a 3D file. It's called model. This doesn't ship with the workspace. I'm going to open this file up. Now this is an empty 3D model. I'm going to come back up to my primary group. Click here. Now we've already looked at reference, raster, and point cloud. The last one is reality mesh, and that's what we're going to select. This is going to bring up a dialog similar to the other dialogs. It has an icon, attach reality mesh. So I'm going to go ahead and click it. Now it's going to ask me where the reality mesh is. Now I've already attached this, so when I click here, it will find it. Here's my cropped area, .3MX. I'm going to go ahead and click open and click OK. And there's my reality mesh attached to this file. Now, once this is attached, you can see this is a 
surface area here, a reality mesh. If I wanted to, I could draw using MicroStation, this is a 3D file, and add elements to this. Or I could cut holes through it to add things in. This could also be exported out to Luminar T, which I'll show in the last video. So that's attaching a reality mesh captured by a drone and then processed by Context Capture. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.